man, it's RFI 40. That wasn't very enthusiastic, I'm sorry. But this week we're doing Graveland, who are like the best band ever, or one of them. Check out those riffs, this is off their first album, Carpathian Wolves. They're like one of the OG, uh, politically naughty black metal bands. And they've been around since like the early 90s or even the late 80s if you go back far enough. They came out of the same milieu as a lot of the Norwegian bands, even though they're Polish. See, all these guys are pulling stuff from Bathory and kind of making it into their own. For instance, Graveland has a riff like that one you just heard. Here's a, a uh, rehearsal version of it. So that's kind of a takeoff on the sort of thing that Bathory would do. Similarly, Emperor before them had riffs like this. Spooky. Some nasty vocals, but you can see how that one's kind of similar to the Graveland riff you just heard. Later on in that song, that Graveland song, there was a little bit of a keyboard and ascending guitar ambient chord action that went a bit like this. And there's a similar thing going on there where that's taken from a Bathory idea that was later expanded upon immediately prior to the advent of Graveland by another Norwegian black metal band, in this case, the one and only Burzum. Sing along if you know the words. So with all that said, given those two examples, you might just think that early Graveland was essentially cobbling together the styles of different Norwegian black metal bands. However, Robert Darkin is far too skilled a composer to simply settle for something like that recombinant. Rather, he brought a lot of new things to the genre. For instance, let's check out the dynamic variation in a track off of the Celtic Winter EP, which came out around the same time as Carpathian Wolves. So, check out the clean guitar here. This was very new for black metal, and as we get further into this section, it's new for metal in general. There's not too much that sounds like this kind of stuff back then. It's very influenced by a lot of like old medieval music, which has always been a big source of inspiration for Robert Darkin, the uh, main guy behind Graveland. This kind of atmospheric thing with flowing melody was also a big influence on all the bands to his east, all those Slavic black metal bands I'm always talking about. So very good introductory sequence for this song before we get into the evil. Nice spooky organ sounds going on here. And of course, very necrotic vocal performance. It's sort of mid-paced drumming that accentuates the mournful and baleful atmosphere. Now we're going to get into his guitar playing, which was one of his big contributions to black metal, this sort of subtly shifting guitar playing thing here. This isn't quite exactly what he was playing before, rather it was a fairly ingenious variation on that initial riff. And then we're into a bit of more thrash influence. So the Bathory influence has always been huge on Graveland, whether it's the old black metal Bathory shit or the more recent Bathory Viking metal stuff. All of that is one of the biggest influences on Robert Darkin's method of composition. Those reverb snare hits are very black metal. Dark Throne did similar stuff on Under a Funeral Moon. But after that, 
we get to the uh, second Graveland full length and the one that got me into the band, one of their best albums, Thousand Swords. So even in these first few notes, you can hear a difference, a change going on in the sound, more of a dreamlike atmosphere, to the point where I would say early Graveland is very nocturnal. Later on, Graveland is some of the only black metal that makes sense to play during the day, if you ask me. Similarly, his ideological outlook changed a couple times. He went from Satanism to sort of Celtic paganism slash Satanism, and now he's moving into uh, Odalism, which is what he's kind of stuck with until today. rollicking drums are a source of contention. A lot of people say that Capricornus, who was the drummer for Greatland at this time, sucked and was very, uh, amateurish. <laughs> Isn't that cute? But it's wrong! Capricornus's drumming is actually perfect for what Graveland is trying to do. A lot of people say that it sounds backwards or off time. In fact, it's simply more influenced by uh, old medieval European styles of percussion than it is by our modern rock influenced sensibilities. For instance, in a later track on the album, you can hear the guitar and the drums interlocking for a dynamic effect where he's using drum fills to elide musical phrases into each other very successfully. So the pattern here is that kind of ride cymbal thing that then goes into the double snare hit into the drum fill as the riff moves back around. So this is not amateurist drumming. This is drumming that's done with an ear for where the song is trying to go rather than simply showing off blast beats and such. And more of that galloping style groove that he has throughout the album that some people find distasteful. I'm not sure why. I guess they're just dumb. You can see the keyboards here have really been stepped up from the slightly cheesier organ sounds to more of a choir sound that fits the music as it evolves. But getting back to that first song I played you off of this album, I talked about how this is kind of like sunlight black metal as opposed to like really dark and evil stuff. It's still violent and it can be dark, but it goes into slightly more positive territory. For instance, in that first song I played off of it. So we're in the atmospheric phase of this song, going into a more warlike phase right here. Once we get through this riff, which I forgot repeated. Sorry! <laughs> Here we go. Very hostile buildup. Also, check out the interaction between the guitar and your left and right channels. Very interesting stuff. Kind of like a violin viola section thing going on. And then a downright happy riff. Joyful in uh, the slaughter of racial enemies. These guys got in trouble uh, with various European authorities for that sort of thing. Whoops! But this was pretty new to black metal at the time, and there's still not a lot of bands that can pull off riffs like that successfully. And the composition is also increasing in complexity, but also fluency. Graveland's not a band that's about throwing in a whole bunch of disparate parts and trying to make it work together. Instead, all these songs are very organically, naturally constructed. For instance, if you remember that uh, intro riff to the track from way back when, it gets retouched and concluded at the end of the song, utilizing some newer keyboard sounds. Here comes that keyboard thing I was talking about. There's also a folk metal, uh, not folk metal, rather folk music thing going on here where they are a little bit more fluid with the temples. They'll speed up and slow down phrases for emphasis so they've elided 
this musical phrase and cut out some of the space between the notes to indicate the fact that the song is drawing to a close. So after this, we get to the Following the Voice of Blood album. And if you thought Thousand Swords was weird in terms of production and drumming style and guitar sound and such, you're really going to think Following the Blood... Following the voice of blood is odd. It's got a really weird guitar sound, a very dry and sharp production for a black metal band. Let's listen. Very bright guitar sound reminds me a bit of what King Crimson used on Lark's Tongues in Aspic, or Aspic, or however you fucking say that. And you're seeing a similar thing to that clip I played earlier where the drums and the guitars have linked up for a cyclical melodic phrase in an interesting way. And then we get into a more threatening riff to go along with it. At this point, you really can't accuse Graveland of just being influenced by the Norwegian bands are even being Bathory. This is pretty much all coming straight out of his noggin, his own head. Nobody else really sounds like this. Again, some great Capricornus drumming. So a lot of people think this is just kind of ugly and strange, and it reminds me of a conversation I had with Tommy the other night about Graveland, where I was showing him pictures of Rob Darkin in his black metal gear and he's just like wow look at this goober and then I showed him a later on picture where he dropped the corpse paint and went a little more Hema-ish and he thought he looked like even more of a goober so in that way Graveland is emblematic of black metal and that's a lot of elements that many people would find strange whether it's how he dresses up or how the vocals sound or how the guitars are the production and such each taken on its own it's like bad and weird and doesn't make sense, but if you go into it with the right mindset and it all knits together for you, it actually makes a lot more sense than uh, normal people music for me in terms of how it all feeds into each other. If that makes sense. It probably doesn't because you haven't listened to enough black metal yet. It's an acquired taste. I think uh, Maniac, the... One of the many vocalists for Mayhem, see, they tend to kill themselves <laughs> or get murdered in that band. But Maniac, uh, he said that black metal, the way you appreciate it is similar to the way that you appreciate opera. You have to take it as a whole package deal, and it's very much an acquired taste, but one well worth acquiring, given how it's rewarding. The uh, most famous song on Following the Voice of Blood, the one that Nocturnal Mortem later on covered is Thurisaz, which is very well written and does a lot of interesting juxtapositions of melancholy and triumph and a lot of different emotions in a black metal song. So let's have a listen to the intro of that one. One of the things that sets black metal apart from other genres of metal is the way it uses like full chords instead of just power chords. Power chords were the initial thing that made metal stand out from rock music because you can move them around the neck of the guitar more fluidly and thus provide you with uh, new melodic possibilities. However, black metal guys do the same thing utilizing bar chords and just a lot of weird chords. They know their way around their instrument very well, so they have the same fluidity of motion without being limited to just the regular fifth interval. That gong is straight out of Manila Road, and in fact, Robert Darkin has spoken on many occasions about how Manila Road might actually be the biggest influence on his music, especially nowadays. And indeed, he's sort of the Manila Road of black metal in that he's been around forever, and he's still making music that's interesting and moves the genre forward instead of either resting on his laurels or selling out. I always buy the new Graveland album because it's always good. He always does something interesting with it. Just think of how different this is 
from the other albums I played you just on this podcast segment. He always switches stuff up every album. He's exploring new territories. A lot of ideas up in that guy's head. Another thing where he uh, speeds it up for emphasis to get into the uh, transition. So that melody, the one that we've been lurking in the domain of for the past minute-ish, is the whole foundation of this track. It's all built on that one particular melody, which is a very good one. But just playing that over and over for eight minutes would obviously get a little boring. So what he does is he explores that melody in new ways. For instance, after we get through you know, a bit of a blast beat section with that melody, we're hit with this transition riff. Which, if the uh, musical phrase, that central melody I played you earlier was the body of the animal, that's kind of like the tail coiling up at the end. But from there we get into an exploration of that theme in greater detail as we experiment with tempos and cadences and counterpoints and all that good musical shit, you know what I'm saying, YouTube? So that one is almost a revisitation of that Bathory-influenced riffing technique they were using very on early in their music. You know, for reference, here's that again. They've updated that rather dark riffing style with their new, uh, brighter way of writing melodies. So from that revisitation of the past with a little bit of a percussive riff, we get into a more fluid take on the same general idea. Which leads us to this conclusion. see there it's going back into that very drum and gong heavy section that you heard earlier so great album maybe my favorite graveland release overall but there's been so many good releases from the rob darkin camp and it is the rob darkin camp he's graveland especially at this point uh karkaroth was the bassist on thousand swords and on following the voice of blood and i want to say celtic winter as well and he actually had a his own band that had the same members, so Karkaroth, Rob Darkin, and Capricornus. But uh, instead of having Darkin write all the songs, it was all Karkaroth songs. That was called Infernum. That was also a really good band. Unfortunately, Karkaroth like had schizophrenia or something and went nuts. Attempted to kill Fenris from Dark Throne at one point, like taking a ferry up to Norway and all that shit. And later on was like kicked out of the band for narking on them to the police. So that's a bit of a mess. Capricorn has stuck around for the album after following the voice of blood, which was called Immortal Pride. Also very good. But he kind of went his own way with a band called Thor's Hammer that did a lot of good stuff. But he eventually succumbed to a uh, hard drug abuse, which is rampant in the uh, Eastern Bloc. And nobody's really heard from him since like 2005. He's doubtful he's even still alive. Rob Darkin. Main songwriter for Graveland is still keeping the flame going today, and we might cover the rest of the uh, voluminous Graveland catalog at a later date, but for now, this, uh, I would say this is more than long enough coverage of three of the greatest Graveland albums, and Graveland's one of the best black metal bands, so you should listen to them and stop being a homo all the time. (laughs) 